Friends, we are two minutes to our live broadcast, and I love that I am seeing a number of you already joining in, settling in, getting ready to watch. If you are sitting down in front of your computer, in front of your phone, wherever you are, please go ahead and introduce yourself in the comment box and let us know where you are joining us and watching from. We're coming to you live from Caesars Palace in Las Vegas from the Breathing Wellness Conference that got underway today. So I'd like to welcome you, ah, Sanjeev, joining us from Toronto. It's nice to have you with us. Dr. Jane was on our broadcast a number of months ago, brilliant in the area of sleep studies, and it's great to have you joining us from Toronto. Please go ahead and continue to introduce yourselves. We're hoping from people all across North America as you normally join in and say hello, but it does help in furthering the conversation where I can understand you're coming from. Hello to Kathy Griffith joining us from Edmonton. Welcome. David Steady joining us. Is that from San W, San Francisco? From I, I missed where the location is. Uh, Brenda, always with us, joining us from Las Vegas. She is here as well as part of the Breathing Wellness Conference. Susie Ang is joining us from Toronto. Welcome to you, Susie. Great to have you with us. I love it. And I, of course, am in Caesars Palace in Las Vegas and happy to be here. I am joined by Dr. Tamari Height is with me as well as locked as long as uh, or part of me as well as Dr. Magnus Ochier. She is here as well. And you're going to be hearing from both of them momentarily. But uh, it's going to be a really powerful conversation today. And we welcome you to join into that conversation. So you do not have to wait until I have interviewed any of the doctors today. We want you to be posting your comments, posting your questions as we go through our conversation tonight and as our doctors and our experts are presenting. So please go ahead, like I said, and introduce yourself, where you're joining us from. And if you do have any questions throughout the broadcast, please go ahead and type them in the comment box and I will bring you into the conversation. For those of you just logging on now, I can see the numbers growing. We're coming to you live from Las Vegas, the Breathing Wellness Conference that is underway here at Caesars Palace. A number Number of experts from across North America are here for the conference that is taking place over the next four days here in Las Vegas. Welcome to each and every one of you. I love seeing the numbers grow. As I mentioned, please go ahead and grant StreamYard, which is the broadcast technology that we are using permission to use your name and then you can go ahead and introduce yourself in the comment box and let me know what your name is and where you are joining us from. We're going to be getting underway momentarily, but before we do, I just want to give everybody ample time to get settled in and comfortable to watch our broadcast today. It's going to be a powerful one on the conundrum of the AHI conundrum, we're calling it. And if you work in sleep, you're going to understand exactly what we're talking about. Why is there all this confusion when we talk about the AHI conundrum? What does it mean? Our doctors are going to tackle that with some powerful insight in that area. Oh, David Steady already uh, weighs in with a question saying, I have severe sleep apnea. I stop breathing once every minute over 50 times an hour. David, you need to listen to this conversation because you're going to gain some powerful knowledge as you do. So in the interest of time, three experts with us, I am going to get our broadcast underway and as I mentioned at the beginning, as I welcomed all of you, tonight is another very important conversation as we bring together, we like to say, the pieces of the puzzle in the diagnosis and treatment of sleep apnea. 
As I mentioned, I will be joined momentarily by three leading experts in their field. And the focus tonight is on the AHI conundrum. It's a difficult and often confusing topic. And we're going to discuss how AHI is used in the diagnosis of sleep apnea and how does this measurement compare between the various forms of technology. The goal is always with these conversations is to get doctors and dentists to collaborate and communicate accurately with each other when it comes to sleep apnea. I want to welcome right now, we have a, a comment here from the Canadian Academy of Clinical Sleep Disorders Disciplines. Welcome to you, whoever that is that's joining us. Also, welcome to Dr. El Saraj, if I'm saying that correctly, hello from Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. I can see a number of our doctors that you will be hearing from momentarily smiling in our virtual green room. I think they know exactly who you are. So thank you for introducing yourselves. I certainly appreciate it and it does help with the conversation. So with that all in mind, let's get started. And I want to begin by just extending a warm welcome to each and every one of you, doctors or dentists, research friends, joining us from across North America and beyond. And maybe, as I mentioned, from right here in Las Vegas, as we kick off our live broadcast from the Breathing Wellness Conference from Caesars Palace in Las Vegas. This is our eighth live broadcast we are bringing you in our Science of Sleep Apnea series. All the conversations have been insightful discussions in all kinds of medical and dental fields. We brought you those types of conversation from so many experts. So if you are watching this conversation right now, and if for any reason you have to leave or you want to re-watch it again, all of the broadcasts that we have done to date can be found on the website, thescienceofsleepapnea.com. So go and check that out there. There are so many broadcasts leading up to this one, rich, rich in information on the science of sleep apnea. As you can see again, www.thescienceofsleepapnea.com is where you'll find all of those broadcasts. So far in this series, we have interviewed a cardiologist, a neurologist, a sleep specialist for both adults and pediatrics, a medical doctor, an otolaryngology head and neck surgeon. And today we will have two previous guests joining us to tackle the issue of understanding the AHI conundrum for diagnosis and follow-up of sleep apnea. Friends, my name is Carrie Dahl. I was a longtime medical reporter and six o'clock news anchor turned public speaking coach and podcast host. I'm so honored to serve as your host for tonight's virtual event. I want to say thank you for the time that you're taking out of your busy life to listen and participate in tonight's broadcast and to learn more about the incredible work that is involved in diagnosing and reversing sleep apnea. As I mentioned, we want this broadcast to be as informative and as interactive as possible. So please, we encourage you to join in on the conversation. On that note, I want to welcome David Rawson, the president and founder of the Canadian Academy of Clinical Sleep Disorders Disciplines, watching you from London, Ontario, Canada. Hello to you, David. We appreciate you weighing in on our conversation as well. And if so, if you have any questions tonight of the experts that I'm going to be talking to do, just make sure that you grant StreamYard, which is the broadcast technology that we are using tonight, permission to use your name, and you can post your questions in that little comment box that's at the bottom of your screen. The format for the next 60 minutes will look something like this. I will begin by interviewing Edmonton dentist, Dr. Tamari Height, who has successfully reversed sleep apnea in a number of her patients. Pediatric sleep specialist Dr. Manisha Whitmans will follow Dr. Height's presentation talking about the different AHI metrics and what exactly they mean. And finally, internal medicine specialist Dr. Solvag Magnus Docher will speak to the accuracy of sleep image to calculate AHI how the sleep image AHI compares to AHI that is calculated for polysomnography studies that is currently the gold standard to compare new methods in the field of sleep medicine too. Then I'm going to bring back Dr. Height and Dr. Whitman and Dr. Magnus Docier and the three of them are going to get together and tackle this conundrum. A lot to cover tonight, friends, but research in this area 
is changing lives and building important bridges between medicine and dentistry and of course bringing all of those pieces of the puzzle together. We are going to wrap up at 5:30 Pacific time, 6:30 Mountain Standard Time and once again just want you to keep in mind if you are not able to watch this whole broadcast or if you want to share it with any of your friends, all you have to do is go to the website the science of sleep app Apnea.com. So with that, let's dig into this conversation by welcoming Dr. Tamari Height, who, as I mentioned, is the driving force behind these broadcasts and so determined and so passionate about fostering more collaboration between doctors and dentists in diagnosing sleep apnea and ultimately in saving lives. Dr. Height has spent the last 25 years working in general and craniofacial dentistry and lecturing worldwide for 10 years to dentists, orthodontists, and medical doctors on her published research and findings. Dr. Height has successfully reversed sleep apnea, which she will talk about. She is on a relentless mission to get dentists and doctors to work together on the diagnosis and the treatment of sleep apnea. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Height to our live broadcast tonight taking place in Las Vegas. It is so great to see you, Dr. Height. Hi, Carrie. Welcome, well, everybody. <laughs> yes, it is exciting to be here live from Caesars Palace, isn't it, for the Great Breathing Wellness Conference. Yes, it's very, very exciting and fun for the Breathing Wellness Conference and to finally go somewhere, uh, although we are <laughs> uh, masking and everything. But um, yeah, we're, we're doing this. Uh, I've actually crossed the border. So it's great to be able to do and this. And we can say, uh, yes, days. it is. And so have many other people. And of course, not getting on a plane without that COVID test. So we feel safe. There's masking. We're happy to be here. So let's dig in, Dr. Height, and talk about what exactly is AHI, if you can go ahead and explain it. So um, as, as you all know, I'm a dentist, so I feel like uh, dentists and medical doctors uh, work best if they kind of stay in their lane. And I'm, um, you know, as a dentist, I just understand that there's three measurements that medical doctors use and that some medical doctors prefer one of these measurements over the other. So the apnea hypopnea index uh, is AHI. Uh, respiratory disturbance index is RDI and oxygen desaturation index is ODI. And you can find one, two, uh, sometimes three of these on different reports from many, many different uh, sleep machine, take home sleep study machines. Um, the polysomnography uh, um, test is done in the hospital and it's much more detailed. But um, essentially, my understanding from my medical colleagues is if we're doing something to change these parameters, or if we're testing these parameters, we should compare apples to apples. So mm -hmm. um, if, if you're using one particular kind of take home sleep study machine to use that same machine on the patient when you've implemented some treatment so that uh, there's no mixing up of these. However, realistically, um, you know, and I can use myself as an example, I had a, a Medibuy Junior take home sleep, sleep study and just uh, fabulous uh, support from that group. And I would see them at conferences all the time. I love that thing, but now there's sleep image. So how do I compare the results from many by junior to sleep image. And that's mm -hmm. kind of where the conundrum is. And, and then trying to communicate with other people who have other kinds of measurements. So break that down even further, Dr. Height, as to why it's a conundrum. I love that you use that word, but there is a very specific and important reason why. So if you guys, if everybody's watching right now could, could look up that word conundrum to see what it really means, because I love that word because <laughs> it's, it's, uh, we want to solve the conundrum today um, in a live broadcast. And we've got some experts here. I'm going to explain that, you know what, the patients come into the dentist for a regular dental checkup. Uh, we are now 
required to screen patients for sleep apnea. And to do that, we need to know a little bit about it. And if we suspect they have it, we refer them to the MD. And then the patient can go to the MD and we can treat them also in dentistry. Or the patient might come through to the MD. And once the MDs discover what it is we're doing in dentistry to actually reverse sleep apnea, they're going to be referring them to us, us dentists. And that's what's mm -hmm. happening. And so the patients come in from two angles and then the MD also uh, treats the patients as well uh, with, with um, it's a medical condition. So there could be many other conditions. So working collaboratively to, to have an unhealthy person become a more healthy person is both of our goals. And it's also the goal of the patient. So a multidisciplinary approach is very, very powerful. And so then the question becomes like, how do we communicate these sleep study results and how important are they to diagnosis? And even more important, the big question now is follow-up. You know, we've, we've reversed sleep apnea in patients. How long does it last? Does it stay mm -hmm. away forever? Like, who doesn't have those questions? So <laughs> let's, let's uh, just keep testing everybody. Let's get on the same page. Let's put this AHI, ODI, RDI all into perspective because guess what? We're all going to be testing this forever on everybody. And we need something simple, easy, not expensive. Patients need to be able to understand how easy it is. And that's the conundrum. We want to put things in perspective. And my hope is that all the professionals on this call will ask these guys the questions because, frankly, I'm not going to understand half of what Manisha mm -hmm. Whitman's and what Dr. Magnus Docher talk about. <laughs> but I, I want to know if some of the sleep specialists on this call have questions or that they're comfortable with this piece of the of the diagnosis, because it's more than just the sleep study. Mm -hmm. It's also the history, the exam and other things. So that's kind of what we're trying to drill down to. So in the spirit of getting everybody on the same page, in your opinion, Dr. Height, like what is the most accurate way to measure sleep? Well, my, my understanding, it's the polysomnography. And, um, you know, if you go on the internet and Google it and, and look up images, this is what you see. And I'm kind of like, wow, um, that, that doesn't look comfortable. Uh, but they just get wicked information from that but it doesn't measure sleep quality, but it's very, very accurate. It is, my understanding is it is the gold standard. And so Dr. Whitman's will give us a bit more detail on that, but that's what it looks like. You go into the hospital, you get hooked all up and you, you try to go to sleep while someone's watching you. <laughs> yeah, but how, I, that's, how is that even possible? How do you sleep with all of those wires hooked up to you? Well, I don't know, but then, you know, of, of course, and it's also very expensive and then it takes a long time to get in. Um, so, so that's why there's like many, many different kinds of take home sleep studies. And here are the kids because, um, uh, you know, uh, some of these studies that we're able to use on kids, they have to be approved to use on children. But, uh, you know, the take home studies have a bunch of different things. They uh, have straps around the the chest and the waist and something clipped on the finger and then the nasal prongs that hook around the ears. And, you know, we tape it to the face and everything and we can play games with the kids and make it fun and all that sort of thing. And then, and then people are, okay, let's, let's make it even easier and we can have like a watch and something to put on the thumb. But now the technology, I mean, this is, this is techno boom here. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, now the new technology is, is we can, you know, if you go to the next slide, this is what we have now. And it's a ring on the finger and you, you're sleeping in your own bed with these kinds of sleep studies. So, but this, this one, you know, basically connects up to your iPhone, which I think everybody has one <laughs> and um, you can charge it up on your computer and you can, it's so cheap to do this. You can sleep with it multiple nights in a row. And what I like doing is, you know, if I'm treating a patient with a dental device uh, in combination with CPAP, I want to know what the night of sleep looks like with just the CPAP or, or, mm -hmm. or the mask with just the dental device with the combination of the CPAP and the dental device. And ultimately I want to try to reverse the sleep apnea. So I'm also going to test it with nothing. 
And so, you know, the patient can wear this eight nights in a row, four nights in a row and try on all, all of it and actually titrate their own device. And then they can see how they feel when they wake up in the morning. And we want to see the progress we're making as we're, you know, developing the craniofacial region to improve the upper airway anatomy. And, and just to be clear, this is not the aura ring. This is your scientific technology that's used for, by, by doctors. Yes, and, and that's something uh, we want everybody to understand is that there are rules and protocols put forth by governing mm -hmm. bodies. Like you can't just, you know, make one. Yes, <laughs> You've exactly. got to pass a bunch of stuff. So um, it's important for dentists to understand that it's safe, you know, if it's an approved device and that some of these devices that the information technology is just exploding. So even the medical doctors are just learning about this new technology, and then they want to test it and make sure it's mm -hmm. it's good enough. And to, to be able to compare this ring to that polysonography that you just saw is, is quite unique. Yeah, yeah, it it's really, kind of really like, is. Yeah, it reminds me of when I got a dishwasher. I thought, really? Uh, what? <laughs> it's a good but analogy. Then you do it a few nights yes. and you go, hey, it works. Okay, so in light of all this new technology, which is so exciting to see these advances being made, how does all this save time and money in healthcare? What's the impact there? Oh my God. Well, it, from a dental perspective, everybody comes into your clinic to get their teeth cleaned and check their healthy people. Mm -hmm. But when you start looking for, you know, the the silent, the silent epidemic of sleep apnea, you start analyzing people and dentists start to understand the craniofacial features that will appear in patients. Um, then it's so easy to send them home with one of these devices. And as a dentist, I don't, I don't read these studies, but I can explain them. Uh, this report as an example is on a 46 year old person who took one of these rings home. And I, the, basically the way I say it is, you know, Green is good, yellow is caution, red is bad. So first let's look at that signal in the bottom there and you can see the word signal in that long skinny line there. Uh, you know, a lot of it is red and there's some yellow in there. So mentally I try to subtract that and go, well, that's sort of not that great a signal, but you know, as long as we have four hours worth of data, maybe we can run another night uh, and pick the best study and then we can go ahead and send that off uh, to the board certified sleep specialist. But what's brilliant is this thing, the morning of, I can log onto my computer and look at this for the patient and say, you know, wear the ring another night and say that signal's all green. Then I can say to them, yeah, you know, um, under the category of sleep apnea there, there's your AHI and it's 30. And I know, you know, in my mind that would be severe, but we're going to send this to the sleep specialist or what I do is I actually get it read by the sleep specialist first. And then I present it to the patient. I describe um, that the apnea hypopnea index, I say, you know, uh, that means you stop breathing 30 times mm -hmm. a, an hour. And, you know, a fellow came on and said his was severe. Well, you're not alone, man. Uh, I mean, <laughs> there's all these people coming into my clinic and they're getting this and they're just like, going, Oh my God, that's why I feel like crap. And mm -hmm. now I've got a sleep study. And not only that, the sleep quality is up there. So for those people who, who have reported, uh, you know, sleep issues, and they've had negative sleep studies, I've seen this where the sleep apnea categories are green, but the sleep quality and the sleep pathology are red. Now, now you can start to measure some of these things. And, you know, that's when, um, you know, it's going to impact healthcare in the sense that people are going to be more aware of their health and maybe do things that are um, more proactive with sleep hygiene. You know, as an example, Matt Walker wrote a book, Why We Sleep. It's a, a an international bestseller. Everybody should read that because mm -hmm. it's brilliant and it gives you information on how you can be healthier. Like we already know we shouldn't smoke and our weight should be good and all that stuff. But I think that's going to save uh, money and time in healthcare because it's so efficient and fast and it gets to preventive, just being able to measure things. You know, Dr. Hyde, I think you're giving hope to David Steady, who's uh, weighed in a couple of times. I'm just going to um, 
read his comments. He said, in 2016, I had a sleep study with all those wires after I had a heart attack. Mm -hmm. And he, I'm going to, he must be referring to his doctor, said I had severe sleep apnea, stopped breathing over 50 times in an hour. He goes on to say, and I didn't have a problem falling asleep. I could have slept on a rock. And then says, they also diagnosed me with sleep shift disorder with my sleep apnea, gave me provigil. He said, I will fall asleep standing up during the day. My wife and I would go to the kids' school for a play or something, and I fell asleep standing up. This isn't unusual. And this is speaks to the importance of the issue, how many people are, are battling it, and why, to your point, everybody needs to get on the same page, speak the same language, so that we can save time and money for patients, for healthcare, for experts. And that too speaks to the essence of the conundrum that you alluded to, which you did and such a brilliant say, job. Well, I, and I want to thank him for, for saying that because um, medical doctors and dentists, if you open the door and, and to a patient and they get to spill out their story like that, it's like, finally, I get to say something. But, mm -hmm. you know, I want to encourage the medical colleagues that dentists can really help you with this. So you got to learn what dentists are doing to help your patients that have sleep apnea and don't be afraid to diagnose them and get a dentist help. Dr. Height, thank you so much for your insight today. We're going to bring you back a little bit later to join in a conversation with your colleagues, but for now, I'll let you catch your breath and we'll talk to you in a bit. Thank you. It is now my pleasure to welcome pediatric uh, Dr. Manisha Whitman, a renowned board, board certified specialist who also subspecializes in pediatric pulmonology. Dr. Whitman's completed her medical training at the University of Saskatchewan, her residency in pediatrics, and her fellowship in pediatrics respirology at the University of Calgary, Alberta Children's Hospital. She completed additional fellowship training in pulmonology and sleep medicine at the Children's Hospital, Los Angeles. California. After returning to Alberta, she developed the pediatric sleep program at the Stollery Children's Hospital in Edmonton. Dr. Whitman's is striving to improve sleep and patient care for children and their families. And she is here back with us tonight, joining us from Edmonton, Alberta to weigh in on this conversation. Dr. Manisha Whitman, so nice to have you with us again. Welcome. We wish you were with us in Las Vegas right now. I wish I was too. Thank you so much, Carrie and Dr. Height, for uh, that uh, brilliant uh, start. Um, thank you, David, for sharing your story. I don't know how long you suffered for, but my heart goes out to you because uh, I uh, shared that story with you in my own way. Um, so uh, let's uh, get started. Carrie, if you wouldn't mind sure. sharing the slide. Thank you. So let's begin by talking about the difference between the RHI and the RDI, pardon me, and the AHI and how it is calculated and what are the thresholds and differences in children versus adults because there is a difference. Yep. Uh, I'll just uh, before I answer that question, uh, remember uh, Dr. Height showed you those two pictures of a child and an adult. This is a simple, nice version of some of those squiggles or the stickers that measure things. So the things that we are measuring, the stickers on the head measure what we call the EEG or the brain waves, and we're looking for arousals or perturbations in that signal to tell us that something's happened. Um, we look at muscle movement because uh, it can show teeth grinding or muscle activation. We're looking at airflow through the nose to measure that. Um, to determine if there's an apnea or not. And then we're looking at chest movement and abdominal movement and the oxygen levels, as well as the EKG or the heart rate. So if you look at the bottom, you can see the squiggle, uh, which is a single lead heart rate where it's speeding up. And then with the event, it actually slows down and speeds up again. And uh, Sleep Image uses some of this uh, sophisticated technology and uh, our guest uh, after will explain that in more detail. But when we look at that PSG, not only is it expensive and cumbersome and labor intensive, so there's a, a human that counts up all these squiggles and these lines one at a time all night. So uh, even to do the test, it's not like the ambulatory study. You don't get it the next day. It takes time. There's a little bit of a human component in how it's evaluated. Um, in a kid, even one event per, per hour and apnea per hour is can be abnormal. So the bigger or the fancier the test, you get 
more information. The more information, think of it like a puzzle of 100 pieces. If you have 95 pieces, you can kind of guess what the five missing pieces might be and figure it out. But the less information you have on, on the study, the smarter the clinician, the dentist, or the doctor has to be to figure out where that gap is between, um, you know, the puzzle that has 20 pieces only out of 100 versus the 95 out of 100. So on a PSG, this is what we're measuring. And this is how we calculate the apnea hypopnea index. We count them up. So next slide, please, Carrie, and I'll come back to answer your question. Mm -hmm. I just want to explain the backstory. So this is an example of an obstructive apnea. So there's no airflow. You can see EG on the first uh, signal. And then there's no airflow. So the person is obstructing. They're still having work of breathing. And they're making an effort. And you can see progressive effort. And then that leads to an arousal. So David, when he said he was doing this 50 times, he was doing these things 50 times every hour. So almost every minute. And then a hypopnea is when there is still airflow, but it's partially obstructed with progressive work of breathing and associated with an arousal. So these are just examples of some of the things we're measuring by the PSG and even some of the ambulatory tests that we're looking at. Next slide, please, Carrie. Okay. Perfect. So those other tests that uh, Dr. Height showed you uh, where their little kids had a little monitor on the chest with belts and an mm -hmm. oxygen tubing and then the wristwatch and another lead. These tests measure only parts of some of that information. So when you asked what an AHI is or ODI, it's calculate from the recording time. Because we don't have the information that EEG, uh, like in a PSG, it underestimates the AHI because it's recording all of the rec time and it's not actually working out the time the patient is asleep. So it's not quite as accurate, if you will. It's more a granular view or it's a more satellite big picture view than a granular view. And so if the person just lays there and has insomnia, then it, it, it may not tell us the actual story about what's going on. And because the PSG or the HI involves measuring EEG and arousal or sleep, these events are underscored or underrepresented because we can't measure arousals. So the problem with the home sleep studies is it's not quite as good as PSG. So um, Sleep Image uh, has tried to bridge that gap and uh, you'll hear about that in a minute. There's no information for sleep stage. There's higher technical failure rates. So someone might take off the ring. They're not as all as good as John was to keep the ring on all night. And so it, you know, the, these tests are really good if the index of suspicion is really high, but it doesn't work for everybody. So if you have someone who has insomnia or they don't sleep very well or they're young and healthy, these tests may not be able to pick it up. And um, it, it the assumption behind that is that there's no other sleep disorders or respiratory or associated cardiac disease. So the REI or RDI, these mm -hmm. are disturbance indexes, and it's a measure, um, but it's limited because the arousals, either autonomic or cortical, may or may not be measured, and the wake after sleep onset isn't accounted for. Next slide, please. So when we look at all these different measurements, we're trying to figure out, uh, you know, one test to the other. Is it really like comparing an apple to an mm -hmm. orange? Is it comparing an apple to an apple? Does it matter whether it's a, you know, um, a gala apple versus, you know, a honey crisp? <laughs> what difference does it make? And, you know, if, if in David's case, well, David, I'm going to pick on you a little since you've been so forthcoming and uh, gracious. Um, in someone like him, it wouldn't matter what study you use. There might be some variability in the number, but it's going to be severe sleep apnea. But even in children and adults, there's a difference in how you measure the count. So in kids, it's two breaths. If you count it out, it it's the equivalent to 10 seconds. So two breaths in a kid where there is a change in the respiratory parameters is is it's not very long. Where in an adult, like the examples I showed you, it has to be a lot longer. And the apnea hypopnea index that we measure, um, there are specific uh, differences in children versus adults. And I've just put the numbers there uh, for your uh, information. And 
this is all based on total sleep time. It, the index is calculated based on hours of sleep. So based on those signals and what you're measuring, you can appreciate that those take-home studies may not be quite as accurate and they misrepresent what's going on. Um, and then even how they measure oxygen desaturation, that can vary. Another part that makes this really hard in adults, we know that at 15 to 20 events per hour, it's been associated with hypertension and cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. Um, but in kids, you know, even in the index between one to three where it is abnormal, what you might do for the child is very variable. Some kids need their tonsils out, some kids need medical therapy, some kids might need doctor height, even though the number is one or, you know, very close to normal. So some of these nuances involve the history and the physical exam, and that's where the sleep medicine doctor comes in to give it context, and the dentist work together to make sure the root of the tree supports the rest of the tree, and we try and delineate where that individual is affected. So David, for you, it was pretty easy because you know, you're know you a very sleepy guy and you had very uh, very significant sleep apnea and there's even a heart attack as a marker to tell us that there's something, um, you know, that you're struggling with something. In kids, it can look like ADHD, it can look like bedwetting, it can look like behavioral problems, academic failure, um, weight gain, lots of different things. And sometimes you look at the number and you think, well, that doesn't make sense. Why is this child suffering? And the numbers don't quite reflect that mm -hmm. suffering because there's other things that go into this. So this this is just a reference slide for you to know what we're looking at. Next slide, Doc please. Dr. Whitmans, there are so many different things to take into account when you're diagnosing yes. and thinking about it as you so brilliantly um, showed us. But so there must be some sort of regulations by governing bodies to standardize results. Are there? Yep. Yeah, there are. So most of the take home sleep studies are um, regulated by the ASM or your state or provincial uh, government regulatory body. Most of them want to have airflow because they want to know that uh, when when you're wearing a watch or or a ring, it doesn't necessarily it doesn't measure airflow at the nose. So you know, as the technology evolves, in my mind, uh, sleep image that uh, you'll hear about is like cryptocurrency. It's, uh, you know, the money and the coins and the bills are easy, but the technology is so advanced that it's not obvious as to how, you know, measuring um, cardio pulmonary uh, or cardiopulmonary coupling could be a surrogate measure of airflow in the nose. Um, so the, the technology has evolved and it's brilliant. And um, Dr. Sola will tell you how that relates to a PSG. So this has made it easy for me to be able to help the patient and for Dr. Height to help the patient. So someone like David won't wait for months or years trying to get help. Um, so without uh, taking up too much time, we'll uh, go on to our next speaker and we'll come back and circle around to answer the other questions you might have. Dr. Whitmans, thank you so much for the way that you explain things and the analogies that you use. It really helps us understand what this all means and how many things need to be taken into consideration when diagnosing and treating it. I'll let you catch your breath uh, for a moment and we'll bring you back for uh, the group conversation momentarily. Thank you so much. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Solveig Magnus Docier, who graduated as a medical doctor from the University of Iceland in internal medicine and later with a subspecialty as a family physician. For a number of years, she was an expert contributor to Web-Based Medical Society, which is an Icelandic version of WebMD. Additionally, she has a master's degree in business administration from the University of Reykjavik and is an investor and medical consultant with Sleep Image. That's FDA cleared sleep evaluating and diagnostic solutions, which are based on cardiopulmonary coupling analysis, that's CPC, to evaluate sleep, to calculate sleep quality, and an apnea hypopnea index for physicians while evaluating sleep disordered breathing. Please join me in welcoming internal medicine and primary care physician, Dr. Solveig Magnus Docier, joining us from 
Las Vegas as well. It is so nice to have you here. Thank you for having me and uh, good evening to all of you. And thank you for taking the time and a special thanks to David for sharing his story because the reason why we are trying to get uh, attention to Sleep Ahna, the silent killer, is so we will never hear these stories ever again. Um, I wanted to ask you, because you have some really important research that you wanted to share with our listening audience tonight, uh, the sleep image technology, and this is really important, is FDA cleared. And that, that means that the sleep image solution is safe and effective for physicians to utilize when evaluating sleep disorders in their patients in both adults and in children. So for all of you who are listening right now, get out your phones and take a picture of the results that Dr. Magnus O'Shea is about to share with you because they will help you in this journey and take some of the confusion out of what she is talking about. So go ahead. Yeah, so I I just want to emphasize why um, the sleep image technology has this accuracy accuracy that is on level with the polysomnography studies. And if you think about it, uh, sleep is conducted in your midbrain. Um, and it sends signal to the surface of the brain where Manisa was showing you how we measure brain waves to uh, estimate uh, sleep stages so we can calculate the sleep duration. Uh, at the same time, the midbrain sends these signals to the surface of the brain. It also sends signals to the autonomic nervous system uh, that affects our heart rate variability and breathing. And by uh, coupling these signals, cardiopulmonary coupling, we can, as well as we do from the surface of the brain, uh, estimate sleep duration. And that is the key, like Manisa pointed out. If you're going to have an AHI, not RII, uh, you have to have accurate sleep time. So how we did this is we utilized a a document that American Academy of Sleep uh, Medicine has um, published. It is very helpful for companies that are trying to validate the technology but it's also very helpful for clinicians to understand the levels of accuracy they need in specific patient populations. And uh, we did this performance testing both to um, uh, evaluate events per hour and also to um, categorize a sleep apnea into mild, moderate and severe. And on the slide, on next slide, you can see the accuracy that uh, uh, came out of the um, performance testing that we did. We looked at about 1,400 tests in children and 800 tests in adults. And the accuracy is above 90% for um, all uh, disease categories. And this ended, uh, like I will show you on the next slide, uh, that we got an FDA clearance. And the the clearance states that uh, despite the differences, how the sleep emits Apnea hypotenuse index is calculated. Uh, it is uh, demonstrates levels of outcome on par with uh, PhD outcome. And this uh, this uh, conclusion that uh, we came to, and FDA came FDA came to uh, after we have submitted all the data, is that uh, the indication for use of the system is that all healthcare professionals uh, they can utilize the systems to evaluate sleep disorders in their patients. And we have to remember though, that uh, AHI is not a diagnosis. AHI is an output of a test, and then you need a physician to make the diagnosis. And the sleep image apnea hypopnea index uh, presented when we calculate oximetric data, like we do with the ring, is intended for this use to uh, diagnose and manage sleep disorder breathing. So, so, though even this technology is a little bit different from the polysomnography study, you get a very accurate outcome uh, when you look at the AHI. And what you said, Dr. Magnus Ochier, is key when you said all healthcare professionals can use this technology. That's an exciting step further in this discussion and in the treatment and diagnosis of sleep apnea, is it not? It is because sleep apnea is a highly prevalent disorder. In 2019, Benefield and his colleagues, they estimated that 1 billion people are suffering from sleep apnea. And we have too many people like David that uh, 
have this silent disorder, they suffer, their quality of life is low, and we know that the uh, consequences of not treating these disorders, the most serious, are heart conditions and stroke. Um, so it's highly important mm -hmm. that we all healthcare providers try to come together and find these people and help them before they have serious consequences. Thank you for your perspective. How about now we move into a group discussion and bring back Dr. Height and Dr. Whitnans to further this discussion and talk about the importance. It's so great to see you all together like this. And I guess the question I want to lead off with after hearing from all of you is, have we solved the conundrum? Dr. Height. Well, I... I just loved how you guys presented that and, and Carrie too. I just appreciate so much how you're helping with this. I love the idea that people take a picture of those slides that Sola had <laughs> because I mean, it's going to take a bit of time to digest this. Uh, but I just feel like you guys made it very, very clear. And um, I, I think I feel like it's very simple. Um, we're able to use this clinically, you know, it's like getting a dishwasher and somebody said, put a tablet in and press the button. And you're like, really? Okay. And you do it and they're, and it's done. And so like, then you just keep doing it and thousands of dishwashers later, millions were good. So I, I feel like this is, this is really exciting and I think it's going to simplify it, um, and help telemedicine even. So what, what I, I, I feel like yes, yeah. but what do you what, think, Manish? What, <laughs> what I really like, um, you know, um, this uh, group ha is phenomenal. What I love about it is the ease of use. So uh, what happens is the PSG is really hard to get. Uh, now with the pandemic, it's even harder. You know, people don't even get regular care. or There's delay in care because of limited access to hospitals. You don't have to worry about infection control. It's mm -hmm. a ring. It's easy to clean. When uh, a dentist, you know, even for um, patients, um, um, you can look night to night, you can change things. Uh, you know, I can even look at medication trials, I can see if someone has their own ring, I can look at the impact of that. Um, you know, um, they are this, they've just done a brilliant job sleep image, you know, it's just so brilliant and so easy to use. But but it is very comprehensive. And there's a lot more than what we realize or appreciate. It's kind of like looking at the planet earth from from you know space it's beautiful it looks good but when you get to land wow there's a lot more going on than um than we we even know what to make sense of or explain right now dr whitman's there's a question for you from dr jane asking whether yeah. sleep image gives us an r or an hi and rdi which measure do you rely upon um, I look at all of it, um, you know, uh, to me, even the, the graph that they show at the bottom, um, I look at the hypnogram, I look at, uh, it puts, put, puts it in context. So there are some where the HI, where it's really blatantly terrible and the RDI is pretty terrible. That's pretty obvious, but sometimes there's other things going on. And, uh, I'm sad to tell you, I haven't used this technology long enough or well enough to be able to tell you what the fingerprint, if you will goes with certain patients. I look at the whole patient because um, I've found that uh, sleep image is much more sensitive. I've had, uh, you know, you may disagree with me. Um, I've had people that have had home sleep studies where their AHI or RDI or REI or whatever, it's five or, you know, it's just at the threshold, but I've put them on treatment because I think they're really suffering like a David. His was pretty obvious, but there's people that are sleepy and the sleep study is negative. So, you know, it all, it's all to put it in perspective. So, you know, if it sounds like, uh, you know, I'm beating, uh, you know, often it's horses, hoof beats that you hear, but sometimes it's zebras. So in a roundabout way, that's why, as Sola said, it's important to put it in context of the whole patient, because sometimes it has to do with, uh, you know, other medications they're on, it's sleep apnea, especially the little kids or or p women typically with upper airway resistance syndrome, they, they keep waking up. 
So they never, their oxygen levels never drop. They just keep waking up repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly. So the study doesn't do them justice for how fragmented or disrupted their, their sleep is. Whereas I think sleep image has the capacity to show that. Either one of you want to weigh in on that, or should we tackle this next question from Sam Hackams and who asks, does it measure IFL? I, I want to just add, I just want to point something out. Um, you guys just witnessed now a sleep specialist asking another sleep specialist a question and you just got that big long answer. So yeah. what I want to, what I want to point out is dentists, you don't need to diagnose this or, or not diagnose this. When you get a sleep, when you send someone for a sleep study, they've got to be seen and diagnosed by a medical doctor. You don't have to burden yourself with that. And it, you know, otherwise, because you, you don't want to diagnose or not diagnose some somebody when it's not your department, like somebody buys an Apple watch and wears it and it says they don't have sleep apnea. And what if they do? Like mm -hmm. that's risky. You need to consult the professional and um, the, the professionals are the sleep specialists. So I just want to point out how brilliant y'all are, how much we love you. And we want more of you. So all you medical doctors out there, go train to do this because there's a lot of people that need you. But anyway, just thought I'd mention that. <laughs> I'm glad that you did because that was brilliant because it does speak to the conundrum and why we are actually doing this topic today to get more collaboration. And to Dr. Whitman's point, when she showed the piece of the puzzle, this is all part of it, bringing it all together, asking questions of one another and not being afraid to do that. Mm -hmm. I'm not a doctor doctor, but looking at it from the outside in, in order to increase collaboration, that's what has to happen. What's IPL? <laughs> I'm dying to know. Yes. Okay. There we go. Who wants to tackle that? <laughs> it's a football league. So I, I can tackle <laughs> that. Uh, uh, Iceland, Iceland football league. Sorry. I'm just teasing. <laughs> <laughs> they are pretty good. Yes, uh, they, they are. are. The, uh, Inspiratory flow limitation because you do not have airflow in the sleep image technology, not direct. Uh, you do not uh, measure IFL by the traditional way, but because uh, IFL will cause uh, and or may cause arousal, that will show uh, in autonomic arousals that you can see in the fragmentation index. So that's kind of a derived measure. It's not the true IFL. I hope this answers your question. The other way to support what uh, Sola is saying, there'd be changes in uh, the autonomic uh, nervous system with uh, increased negative inspiratory pressure. If you can think back to the signals that I showed you and the perturbations in both in blood pressure, heart rate responsivity, baroreceptor response, it, that all is worked out through that cardiopulmonary coupling. So it's a surrogate measure of the airway resistance and airflow. If uh, so, if you agree with that, and if I explain that right or not, perfect. <laughs> I had to practice for that just to let you know because she's brilliant, and I got to make sure that I can, you know, keep up. Look at all this collaboration going on. I love watching this. And you know what, Doctor Height, I did take your advice. I looked up the definition of conundrum, and okay. it is defined by Oxford Dictionary as a confusing and difficult problem or question, a situation where there is no clear right answer or no good solution. An example of a conundrum is a challenging riddle to which you can't figure out the answer. Now, was did we achieve an answer today? What are your thoughts on this? I want to hear from all of you and go around the table. Dr. Magnus Docher, do you want to begin? Yes, I can begin. I, I applaud the dentist, uh, especially Chamri, for taking this uh, task and try to identify all these people that are undiagnosed. We have so few sleep medicine specialists that it's not, it is not realistic that they can go out there and help these people on their own. So by utilizing people like Chamri and myself, I'm a primary care physician by training. We can go out there with simple technologies, identify the, these people, and then we can team up with managers of the world, and we can prevent things like David having a heart attack. And I, I think that is the key. Let's help each other out to help patients. 
Beautifully said. Dr. Beautiful. Whitman's. Um, I think uh, I, I think that is true. Um, it, as I said before, uh, this is a team sport. So I can't think of any substrate or substance in nature, the airway specifically, that has to balance being the consistency of jello or floppy. Uh, the airway has to be floppy to help you swallow or help us swallow and eat, but has to be stiff to breathe. And with every breath, every bite. Um, you have to get it right. Otherwise, you know, there's aspiration and a bunch of things. So in in this, you know, really complex uh, airway of less than whatever, how many ever inches that is, there's a lot that happens. And it needs Tam and uh, Sola and me to figure out along with the ENT surgeon and all the other people that you've interviewed as part of that to say, okay, how do we precisely address the airway to keep it open to meet the human's needs so they can live their best life? Before I give you the final word, Dr. Height, I'm going to bring in David's comments. And he says, my dentist knows all about my health conditions and my sleep apnea. What questions should I ask her about my sleep apnea? Um, not all dentists. Um, uh, well, I should, I should say dentists are just learning that sleep apnea is a disease of the craniofacial anatomy. And so uh, as a dentist, I think about the teeth and jaws like their garage and the tongue is like a car and it's very complex and very precise. And so an optimal human or an optimally an anatomically optimal human will have jaws big enough to fit all 32 teeth and they're straight and there isn't a deep bite or that means you have a garage with a five foot ceiling but it's um, the bite has a, a lot of precision in it. And this is where dentistry comes in. If the dentist looks at someone's mouth and sees their teeth are crooked or they're missing teeth with straight teeth and stuff like that, they've got to start thinking that that person might have compromised upper airway because it so happens the upper airway is part of the upper jawbone, which is also contains the teeth. So dentists are just learning about this and medical doctors too. And sleep apnea, what, what I've discovered is sleep apnea is, um, not me specifically, I didn't make a discovery, but there's lots of us dentists out here that know that sleep apnea is a disease of this anatomy. And if you change the anatomy to make room for the teeth, then the airway gets better. And the only way we know that is because our patients are telling us, I'm breathing through my nose for the first time in my life wow, look at my sleep study went down. So as a dentist, you can actually make a, a dental device that's, you don't have to use it off label, you use it for what it's made for to grow the upper jaw. And you can just observe these uh, clinical effects of this medical condition, and you will be stunned at the results. So what I would say is invite your dentist to go and learn about sleep and the place I would go to is uh, I would go to Vivos Therapeutics. They're leading this, uh, they're, they're leading the way in this, in teaching dentists about this and, and about collaboration with medicine. There's all kinds of dentists though that do practice sleep medicine and we need to come together. We need to just pool everything together because there isn't enough of us on the planet to help everyone, but we can sure prevent it in kids and things like that. So I would Go to your dentist and uh, get them to watch these webinars. <laughs> and, they'll, and, they'll, and they'll do it for you. It's not hard. It's it's way easier to learn to, to do this than to do a root canal. Oh, my God. That's the hardest thing ever to do. Mm -hmm. I love doing them. But, but really, like we do these things with our hands that are just amazing and incredible, small. And this is one of the easiest things to learn how to do for a dentist. And so uh, your dentist will be fully and thoroughly excited to learn how to do this because she'll be starting to save the lives in her practice, in her entire dental practice, maybe even in her own family. So, I mean, don't hit her with all that, but, <laughs> but get her to watch some of these episodes and learn from the medical doctors what she can actually do to help them.
And you just said the key in why you were so passionate about collaboration and having a discussion with multiple experts like you did today is it's about saving lives. And once you all can get on the same page and speak the same language, that's when change happens. Did I summarize that accurately, Dr. Height? Yes. And, and I'm looking for, um, you know, the clinical trial and everything are starting. Like people are super excited about this. Dr. Magnus Dochier, Dr. Whitmans, Dr. Height, thank you so much for this powerful discussion. We appreciate your time and your expertise, Dr. Whitmans. We hope to see you in Las Vegas with us maybe next year if we're gathered yeah. here. Thank you so much for all that you do to have an impact. And those hearts are coming right back at you. If I could send them up on the screen, I would do it as well. Thank you, Dr. Whitmans. Always great to see you. Dr. Magnus Dochier, we'll see you during the conference. Thank you for your insight today. Appreciate you. And so it comes down to Dr. Height and I, who are gathered right now in Las Vegas for the Breathing Wellness Conference at Caesars Palace. Powerful discussion today. And of course, this was just one of eight broadcasts that we have done to this point. And for those of you who have not had an opportunity to watch any of them, or you want to catch up on the ones that we've done, all you have to do is go to the website, thescienceofsleepapnea.com, and you can watch any of those broadcasts. Tomorrow, we are having a blockbuster discussion because we're taking everything we have talked about here and everything to date And we're going to talk about telemedicine and how that factors into it. But we're going to take this discussion one step further by having not only those of you joining us virtually, but we're going to have a live audience as well. Dr. Hyatt, you can go ahead and talk a bit about what you and Dr. Chopra will be talking about tomorrow. Well, I am am just busting. Um, (laughs) Sleep apnea... Uh, you can you can actually see a medical doctor over the internet. So if you live in Taktoyaktak and you don't have a sleep specialist there, these medical doctors can can help you as a patient with the diagnosis over the internet. And and medical doctors, um, you can learn how to do this. And uh, Dr. Chopra, uh, you know, is leading the way in this. And telemedicine has been used and uh, very, very effectively in other areas. And we're super excited about this because even the sleep image is pretty easy to do. And a lot of this stuff can be done uh, remotely. Like if you had asked me five years ago if I'd be having groceries delivered to my house, <laughs> um, right? you know, I, I'd have been stunned. So um, anyways, I'm so excited about tomorrow. It'll be the first time we're doing this in front of both a live and a virtual international uh, audience. So Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm pretty excited. And Carrie, you're going to knock it out of the park (laughs) because I couldn't do this without you. I got to thank you for that. Oh, Dr. Hyde, it is absolutely my pleasure to be involved in something like this. As I've said many times back in the days when I was a broadcast journalist and a medical reporter, I used to say the words sleep apnea and my phone and my email would literally blow up because there were so many questions and there's such a hunger for knowledge and treatment. So thank Thank you for everything that you are doing in your collaboration with other medical doctors and dentists to impact and save lives. We appreciate you. And I cannot wait for tomorrow. So for all of you watching right now, tell everybody you know to log on virtually, 4.30 Pacific Time, 5.30 Mountain Standard Time. We'll be coming to you live from Las Vegas here at Caesars Palace. We'll have a live audience with experts from around the world, as well as our virtual audience as we tackle telehealth, what's happening there and how it can have an impact in all aspects of diagnosing and treating sleep apnea. So we truly hope that you can join us tomorrow. A few calls and comments today. Brenda says, excellent collaboration. Brenda's with us in Las Vegas. Thank you so much for everything you do, Brenda. Delta Sleep says, great information today and exciting about the new devices to help with diagnosis. Isn't it ever? I share those sentiments and I'm just watching from the sidelines. And Dr. Jane says today, thank you for a great 
presentation. So to all of you who joined us today, thank you so much for sharing your time with us today, for weighing in on the conversation. And we sincerely hope to see you back here tomorrow at 4.30 Pacific, 5.30 Mountain Standard Time as we talk about sleep apnea and telemedicine. On behalf of Dr. Height and I, thank you so much for joining us today and we'll see you tomorrow.